This is the lecture for Patricia Smith Churchland's article, Knowing, or, so, nope, uh, Are Mental States Irreducible to Neurobiological States? So, uh, the first topic. I said in the very introductory lecture that as we went through the readings, we'd talk more about what is philosophy. And this is our first opportunity to talk more about what is philosophy, because this is a reading which falls into a category of philosophy known as philosophy of mind. So philosophy of mind is a big part of philosophy. Philosophers of mind are interested in basically the mental. So what is going on in our heads? How does it work? There's a lot of very confusing stuff attached to this. It is, to a large extent, a mystery. So we have psychology and neuroscience and all of these attempts to understand how our minds work. These fields are very new. They're sort of in their infancy. There's still quite a bit we don't understand about humans. So why do we sleep? How does sleep work? Why are we conscious? How do all of our senses work? All of these things. There's a lot that we don't know. Philosophy of mind is focused on questions like this, and then all of the sort of related questions. So who is conscious or what sorts of things are conscious? Is it just humans? Is it all humans and animals? Are some animals conscious and some animals unconscious? Are some humans unconscious? Maybe you're the only conscious person and everybody else is sort of an invention of your mind. Maybe nobody's conscious. Maybe the whole universe is conscious. Maybe the whole universe is one consciousness. So those sorts of questions, who or what is conscious? How is it conscious or why is it conscious? Where did consciousness come from? Did it evolve? Why did it evolve? If it evolved, what evolutionary role does consciousness play? Uh, what does consciousness consist of? Like, what actually is it? What are its properties? Uh, things like this. And many, many other topics besides. So philosophy of mind is a very interesting kind of philosophy. We get an introduction to it here. Uh, do any of our possible topics cover philosophy of mind? Probably. Actually, maybe not a lot. Most of the historical ones do, but... Um, oh, and artificial intelligent consciousness. That's all about philosophy of mind. So if we vote for that topic, we'll get more philosophy of mind. But uh, this is just to introduce you to one of the big parts of philosophy, which is philosophy of mind. And also, before we move on, this is one of the areas of philosophy that overlaps a lot with other disciplines. So I mentioned earlier neuroscience and psychology and other fields. Those are fields that are very interested in philosophy too. So there's a lot of work sort of between and among philosophers and people in related fields. Cognitive science is sort of like the combined field that sort of like draws in people from everything. Uh, this philosopher we have, Patricia Smith Churchland, she's one of the philosophers of mind who most strongly pushes for the idea that really philosophy has not much to say about this topic. Really, we should leave it to the neuroscientists to figure everything out. And so she has a very neuroscientific approach to philosophy of mind. Other philosophers of mind think, no, science is never going to figure out most of the questions about the mind. These are things that philosophers need to study. And so uh, that's one of the big debates in philosophy of mind. And that's the debate that, in part, uh, this article is about, whether mental states are reducible to neurobiological states. That's point number one. Point number two, at uh, some point in this article, Churchland makes this point about what a Gedanken experiment can establish. Uh, Gedanken, as our textbook helpfully points out, is uh, German for thought, so she's talking about thought experiments. So a lot of this article is about what a thought experiment can or cannot establish how a thought experiment can or cannot establish certain sorts of things. And I raise this for a few reasons. One, because this is an important part of the article, uh, just to sort of have in your mind the idea of a thought experiment and what it can establish. But I raise it also because uh, as we go through this course and we want to learn about what philosophy is, we don't want to just learn what sort of things does philosophy study. That was what we just talked about up in philosophy of mind, but we also want to learn what are like the methods of philosophy. How do philosophers do philosophy? How do philosophers sort of like, like what is it when you're doing philosophy? And so this is the first method that we're going to look at, the idea of a thought experiment. So what is a thought experiment? Well, it's like an experiment, 
an experiment is where you sort of do some sort of test and you record the results and then uh, usually the way you're doing an experiment or often the way you're doing the experiment is that you want to control for some for all the possible variables except that the one you're trying to test and then you want to vary the variable that you're trying to test and you look at the different outcomes based on the variations you make in the experiment and so on and so forth that's all the domain of science actual experiments are the sorts of things that scientists do in philosophy, we don't do actual experiments. I don't have a lab that I work in. Uh, none of my colleagues have labs. But in philosophy, we do do thought experiments. So a thought experiment is like an experiment, but it just goes on in your head. So in your head, you sort of imagine a situation, and then you sort of change things, or you alter things, or you think about things, and then you imagine sort of what would happen, and then you draw conclusions from that. So there's lots and lots of things to say about thought experiments. This is sort of a whole field of philosophy in itself, trying to figure out what is a thought experiment, how do they work, can you ever prove anything? You have people all the way from a thought experiment can never prove anything, it's just useless, up to people who think philosophy or who think thought experiments can establish all sorts of things, and there's debate all the way in between. We of course can't talk about all that right now. Here the point is just twofold. One, here is a sort of thing that we do in philosophy. And number two, look at how they get used in this article. So you get some examples and you can start to think about what do I think about philosophy, about thought experiments in the context of this article and then just in the context of life more generally. One final thought before moving on from thought experiments. It's not just philosophers who do these. So there are some famous thought experiments in other disciplines. I think most notably physics. Theoretical physics is the one that has the thought experiments that sort of are the most famous. So uh, Schrodinger's box or Schrodinger's cat is uh, one thought experiment. Uh, Einstein had some famous thought experiments. There was one where you're sort of on a train and you're flashing a light or some, something, whatever. Um, Galileo had a lot of famous thought experiments. He sort of proved that uh, heavier things do not fall faster than lighter things by imagining uh, two things falling sort of separate and then attaching a rope between them. And so the thought is thought experiments exist not just in philosophy, but in other fields. So that's one interesting thing to think about when you sort of ponder what are they for, who uses them, what can we prove. And we're getting, <laughs> sorry, I said that was the last thing. One more thing. We're going to see lots of thought experiments as the course goes on, probably. So this is not the last uh, encounter we'll have with thought experiments. The third point, just to as as the textbook will note, uh, she refers to uh, first an article by Thomas Nagel. Uh, in fact, she begins with for Nagel, so we start off with Nagel, and then eventually she refers to uh, an article by Frank Jackson, and. Uh, the footnotes point out that Nagel and Jackson are both in the book, the textbook that we're reading from. These are not assigned readings, but uh, if you're interested in this topic, you can go back and read the Nagel, what is it like to be a bat in Jackson, uh, Mary's room, or what does Mary know, or something like that. Uh, you can sort of go get some more information. These readings from the textbook, so the Churchland is the first reading we'll have from the textbook, and we'll have another from Sen later. They're relatively short, relatively straightforward. They're still hard. All philosophy is hard, but um, they're maybe not quite as hard as other things. And so you can also read the Nagel and the Jackson. They're not as difficult as the other things we'll read in this course. So consider doing that. So the final two topics in this lecture, in principle, you can figure them out yourself. And the reading quiz, I think, has questions about both of them, and the, the reading itself has, I think, enough to figure it out. But these can be difficult topics, and so I just want to talk a bit about them in lecture to prepare you. If you wanted, you could stop watching now, maybe come back to the lecture if you're confused about one or both of these topics. But we're going to start with qualia. So qualia is a word, it's a very uncommon word, but we use it in philosophy of mind all the time. It's uh, a plural word, um, it's the plural form of quale, so if you have one of them, you have a quale. If you have a lot of them, you have qualia. And qualia, as uh, Churchland says, uh, they are qualitative character, they are the qualitative character of experiences, sensations, feelings, and so forth. And in fact, they're the qualitative character of experience, sensations, and 
and so forth, to which we have introspective access. So that's an interesting thing. But basically the thought is qualia are the the qualitative character of experiences, sensations, feelings, and so forth. So it's qualitative, so uh, the sort of the qualities, the features, the properties, the qualitative character of experiences, sensations, feelings, so forth. So what are experiences? What are sensations? What are feelings? Well, I mean, it's very hard to talk about them. They're, it, they, like using words to capture them is difficult, but of course, you know what that you're having some right now. Right now, you have the experience or the sensation or the feeling of being lectured at by me. And you have the experience or the sensation or the feeling of sitting or lying down or standing or whatever it is you're doing. You have various audio sensations or audio experiences or um, audio feelings. You have sort of tactile sensations or feelings, whatever you're touching, the clothes that you're wearing. You have visual sensations. So it's the character of those sensations what they feel like or what the sensations are like, like what what it's like to have those, those are qualia. So again, it's a difficult topic to talk about. Like what what is what, what does it feel like to hear me? Uh, well, I don't know. It, it's it's loud or it's quiet. Like I it it's tough to come up with descriptions for these things. But everybody has qualia. You know what qualia are. You have them all the time. Whenever you're conscious, you have qualia. So one way to think about qualia is that they're the sort of constituent components of consciousness. So consciousness is made up of qualia. Another way to talk about them is mental states. So consciousness is just another way of saying mental states. So the states of our mind, your mind consists of qualia. Now you might think, well, I don't know, some parts of my mind are maybe unconscious. So fine, forget those. Qualia are the sort of conscious things going on in your head or whatever they are like the question of what qualia are is uh the question of this article so that's qualia that's quali next leibniz's law so as she briefly explains leibniz's law says that a equals b if and only if a and b have every property in common so as the uh, reading quiz points out, I believe, the equal sign we use in philosophy for identity. And what identity means is that one thing is the same as another thing, or identical to another thing, or the same thing as another thing. Uh, so A equals B means that A is B. A is identical to B. A and B are the same thing. So you might say, well, how can they be the same thing? This is A and this is B, and those are different. Well, A and B are just labels. So I can give those labels to anything. I can put the label A on whatever I want. So I can say, uh, I'm going to call this water bottle A, or um, I don't, don't have other things I can lift in front of uh, these glasses. I can call these glasses A. So I can put whatever labels on anything I want. And in fact, I can just put a bunch of labels on one thing. So I'm going to give these glasses the label A. I'm also going to give them the label B, the label C, blah, blah, blah. And so if I do that, then, of course, A equals B equals C. They're all just the same thing. They're all just my glasses. So what does Leibniz's law say? Leibniz's law says that A equals B if and only if A and B have every property in common. So one small subsidiary point. As the glossary on my webpage points out, and you should be checking the glossary sometimes, sometimes philosophers will write IFF, if, and they mean if and only if. Uh, Churchland is nice enough to write out if and only if for us. So what does if and only if mean? So this is, it, it means the same thing it means in normal English, but it is kind of like a technical term in philosophy too. So it means, if and only if. So if means, <laughs> it's, it's hard to talk about these things in uh, words, but so if I say uh, it will rain if it's cloudy, then you know uh, if there's clouds, then there's going to be rain. And, I say, and if I say it'll rain only if it's cloudy, then that tells you the rain can't come from anywhere else. It's only going to come from the clouds. So either you'll have clouds and it rains, or there won't be any clouds and there won't be any rain. So if and only if is stronger than just if. So if I say, if it's cloudy, then it'll rain. Great, but it might rain even if it's not cloudy. Maybe something else could cause it to rain. 
But if I say only if it's cloudy, will it rain? Then you know only if the rain can't come from anywhere else. So back to Leibniz's law. A equals B if and only if A and B have every property in common. So what this means is you can't ever have A equals B if A and B differ in any property. So what is a property? A property is just a very, very vague term. It refers to any characteristic, any thing. So what are the properties of my glasses? Well, one property is that they have two lenses. Another is that they're sort of brown along the edges. Another property is that I can see through them. Another property is that uh, they have a certain sort of thickness and they weigh a certain amount and blah, this. so these are the prop and that they bend uh, at the hinges. So these are all the properties of my glasses. So my glasses have all of those properties. What are the properties of my water bottle? Well, it's red, it's filled with water up till here, it's got a lid, it's plastic, it makes the sound when I tap it. Those are the properties of my water bottle, and so on. What are the properties of my head? Well, it weighs whatever, it's covered in fuzz and blah, blah, blah. So these are properties. And A equals B, if and only if, they have every property in common. So if you have two things and you're trying to figure out are they identical to each other or not, we look at just, we, let's list out all their properties. So I don't know, filled with water, made of plastic, sounds like this when you tap it, blah, blah, blah. And when I have those lists of properties, I compare them for the two things. And if they're identical lists, every property on one list is a property on the other list, it's the same list, basically, then I've got the same object. So if it's my list over here is full of water, red, plastic, blah, blah, blah. My list over here is full of water, red, plastic, blah, blah, blah. Then, oh, A and B are both the water bottle. They're just different labels for the same thing. But if my list of properties over here is full of water, plastic, so and so, and my list of properties over here is brown and has lenses and so on, A and B are different things. So this is kind of a very, very simple idea. It's not supposed to be like a complicated, strange law or something. It's supposed to be just a very straightforward way of describing identity. How do we know if something is identical to something else? Well, all of their properties are in common. If they have all the same properties, they're the same thing. If they have different properties, they're different things. So that's Leibniz's law. Is it true? Churchland is taking it to be obviously true. If you're interested in debate about this, you can sort of ask me and we can talk about it. But that's what Leibniz's law is. It may not come up a lot in the rest of the course, but I bring it up now, number one, just because she goes through it pretty quickly and so you might be confused. And number two, it is a sort of interesting thing to think about. Is this true? And if it's true, why is it true? And what makes it true? Um, and so since it comes up in the reading, it helps to cover it.